This is an 8mm home movie shot by a lowly citizen named Abraham Zapruder. It captured the death of a president and traumatized a generation, and especially for our purposes, a generation of filmmakers. Zapruder's movie is often claimed as the most watched piece of film media ever produced. And when I say that a generation of filmmakers were traumatized, I don't mean necessarily that they were frightened by it or emotionally scarred by it, but that it was seared into their subconscious, a piece of film that could be viewed over and over again and continually scrutinized, slowed down, sped up, without elucidating anything concrete, other than the palpable feeling that there was something amiss here, that the official story of the tragedy and what was seen on this enigmatic play of film could not be reconciled. And no matter how often one revisits the little home movie, one is left with more questions than answers. The seminal films of many new Hollywood filmmakers or directors of the so-called film school generation feature allusions to an ambient politics of intimidation and murder. In Martin Scorsese's Taxi Driver, the unstable Travis Bickle seeks to make his mark on society by killing a popular politician. Alan J. Pakula's The Parallax View finds Warren Beatty at the center of a political conspiracy to assassinate prominent politicians. In William Reichert's Winter Kills, Jeff Bridges plays the wayward scion of a wealthy family, a construct for the Kennedys, who stumbles upon a clue to the murder of his brother, the late President of the United States. These types of political conspiracy thrillers are numerous enough to form a sizable subgenre of films in the 1970s. Movies like Three Days of the Condor, Marathon Man, Executive Action, The Conversation, The Kremlin Letter, and Winter Kills. The final word for all of these films, though, came out in 1981. Brian De Palma's Blowout, the story of a B-movie sound effects man, Jack Terry, who accidentally records the death of a presidential hopeful as his car careens into a lake. Terry's audio evidence reveals the incident to be more than a tragic accident, and he sets out against all odds to prove it. Hi guys, I'm George Dahl. Welcome back to my film journal. The goal of today's video is to explore the aesthetic merits of Brian De Palma's Blowout, talk about its themes, and compare it to its contemporaries. And I'll also be talking about how Brian De Palma's unique insight into the idea of the American conspiracy effectively ends the cycle of paranoid 1970s conspiracy thrillers. It's a big claim, but I think Blowout is a really interesting uh, and dark and important movie. So let's get started. A luxury car careens off a pier. Inside it are a prominent politician and his mistress. Jack's presence was unplanned. He was collecting sound effects for a low-budget horror film, one in desperate need of the perfect scream sound effect. Kill it. Our hero Jack Terry drops his equipment and leaps into action, and saves the beautiful Sally, a girl he is encouraged to forget by a typically shady government man in a nice suit, not uncommon in a political entourage. You want to tell his wife that he died with his hand up some girl's dress? Or maybe you'd rather she read it in the papers. Well, that is what happened. I mean, that is the truth, isn't it? What difference does that make to you? Jack heeds his advice at first. He, like many American citizens, have been conditioned to believe that if authority figures engage in ambiguous or inscrutable morality, that they must have a reason for doing so. That there must be intelligent plans beyond our comprehension at work. There must be someone in control with our best interest at heart. But Jack has something we don't, and that's tangible evidence to the contrary or at least another fact that someone somewhere should consider. Jack syncs up his audio photographs with cutouts from a magazine, photo evidence of the crash taken by a plant that the conspiracist placed at the scene to collect the right type of evidence for media consumption. These sequences are set to a great proto-synth electric guitar and bass soundtrack by Pino Donaggio, a frequent collaborator of De Palma's. There's also sweeping romantic theme music, but I like these bits best what Pauline Kael called cop TV show music. I love the scenes of Travolta working with his analog equipment to uncover the secret. There's something pure and tangible about working with material by hand, cutting and gluing pieces of film together. All the B-roll is really well shot and intricate. I love editing. I'm working on my own little movie right now, and for sure I live in a blessed era, as I've heard older filmmakers talk all the time about editing on their master tapes, not being able to afford duplicate prints to experiment on. They had to think very hard about what they wanted the cut to be, taking pains not to damage something so fragile as film as it spooled through their hands into a big machine. I think the curiosity of the tangible film elements might add an extra layer of suspense to modern audiences. Jack goes to the police with his footage and is met with, at best, 
suspicion and disbelief. Look, it's very clear in all these photographs, the flash and the smoke. Could be a lot of things. It don't mean nothing. When he returns to his work, he finds it in disarray. Why don't you answer your phone? It's the police. Who's been in here today? Some guy. He said he wanted to... Who? What the guy? Shit. What guy? I don't think I like your tone of voice. This woman, like Jack, initially assumed that if an authority figure needed to see Jack's office, that he must have a good reason. So who is after Jack? And who wants the tapes erased? The sinister John Lithgow carries out the business of scrubbing the evidence. Lithgow, an actor I first encountered as the good-natured and quirky alien father on the sitcom Third Rock from the Sun, turns in a great performance as the sadistic taskmaster of the conspirators. He needs to kill Sally, the living witness, and he devises his own twisted rationale for how to do this and get away with it. I changed the tire, made it look like a blowout. I erased the sound guy's tape so everybody would think it's a crackpot. Carp's disappeared, but I'll find him. But that still leaves the girl. I've decided to terminate her and make it look like one of a series of sex killings in the area. It's usually this portion of the movie that divides its critics. I'm of the mind that Lithgow's murderous rampage does serve to inject the narrative with a sense of encroaching terror. He gives a face to the shadowy conspiracy, and his murders provide the movie with a series of suspenseful set pieces to break up the exposition. Though others see it as a cheap way for De Palma to smuggle in his proclivity for tawdry sexual violence. Some argue that it feels tacked on, or that it doesn't fit the picture. I could agree, but these sequences definitely leave the viewer with a palpable feeling of danger and a longing not to see Sally befall a similar fate, which works well to add anticipation in the film's climax. I love this moment with Lithgow in the telephone booth, where he modulates his voice, adopting the persona of a typical sexually confused killer as a show for the police, while keeping his eyes and face steady, controlled. But don't listen to her, she made me do it. Just tell me where you are. Where? I wonder how De Palma talked with Lithgow before this scene. What would you say to an actor to get that kind of chilling performance out of them? Maybe it was Lithgow. Either way, it's brilliant. It illustrates multiple layers of scary. That a killer would be self-aware enough to know the tired tropes and motivations of a sex-crazed murderer and still carry them out. It's almost more sadistic and scary that he's committing these crimes not out of passion, but bureaucratically like many murders of civilians by 20th century governments, summarily, as a means to an end. It reminds me a lot of Dr. Zhivago, the ending scene where Alec Guinness laments the unknown fate of Lara. One day she went away and didn't come back. She died or vanished somewhere, in one of the labor camps, a nameless number on a list that was afterwards mislaid. Blowout is a movie about the vain attempt to expose truth, and in that way it is also a movie about trying and failing to exercise control, whether that be societally or personally. Travolta's character of Terry is extra motivated to expose the murder plot, not because he's simply a curious citizen, fate having foisted the truth upon him, but because he's trying to make amends for past failures. He's trying to reconstitute control over his life. We get the impression early on in the movie that Travolta is a curiously competent, handsome, and well-adjusted man to be wasting his time recording Foley sound for exploitative junk horror movies. It's odd to watch him get ordered around by crude directors, because by virtue of him being the handsome John Travolta, he's obviously not just your typical nerdy audio wonk. When he finds himself witness to the tragic car crash of the senator, he doesn't hesitate to save Sally, demonstrating bravery. Through Jack's relationship with Sally, we discover why someone like him has been relegated to his current position. Jack was a cop. His job was to wire up undercover officers in order to gather evidence, but he failed to correctly secure an audio device. The one thing the fucking whiz kid didn't think of was maybe that uh, Freddie would get nervous and he'd sweat. He sweating so bad that the battery and the transmitter shortened out and burned the hole in him. Which led to the undercover officer being discovered and killed. Jack has powerful technical skills, skills which before had been used to bring justice to criminals. But when he tragically failed, he went into B pictures as a sort of self-imposed exile. But now, with the audio evidence he's gathered about an assassination, he has a chance to redeem himself. Let me tell you something, all right? I know what I heard and what I saw. And I'm not going to stop until everyone in this fucking country hears and sees the same thing. And you're going to help me. Travolta and Sally have fun chemistry, and I like Nancy Allen as an actor. Here, she's essentially playing the same role she had in Dress to Kill, the hooker with the heart of gold. But she's a little too doe-eyed, naive, and innocent for me. She's never really allowed to do anything interesting other than resist her sorry station as the pawn of scumball Dennis Franz, who keeps her employed as someone who can blackmail rich philanderers. This time, though, they've gotten in over their heads, and he's more than willing to throw her under the bus. But Sally trusts Jack, 
He has noble aspirations, but he's still just using her, but in a different way. Jack knows that Sally is a great piece of bait to draw out the conspirators, and he capitalizes on this. He sends her to meet with an improbably interested and seemingly good-hearted reporter. Go along with me on this. I guarantee you, by 8.30 tomorrow night, every one of those eight million sons of bitches are going to believe Jack Terry's story. I promise you that. Travolta's character of Terry is a lot like Scotty Ferguson, the character played by Jimmy Stewart in Alfred Hitchcock's Vertigo, a character who is driven to insanity by his inability to account for his past failures. Scotty's debilitating vertigo, brought on by fear of heights, plagues his mind, as his failure to overcome this perceived weakness led to the death of a fellow police officer and the apparent death of someone else in his charge, the woman he loves, Madeline. In Vertigo, Jimmy Stewart attempts to reform his shattered world by recreating the dead Madeline, attempting to bring her back to life by enlisting a girl who happens to look a lot like her into his plot. Jack does something similar in Blowout, recruiting Nancy Allen into his scheme to thwart the conspiracy. These attempts, in both films, end in tragedy. When Travolta bugs Sally for her meeting with the reporter, just in case, we as an audience have seen this play out before and we want to grab Jack by his clothes and implore him not to make the same mistake. It's because we realize we are seeing a tragic character enacting the same folly again because it is in his nature. Jack has a lot of confidence in his talents and abilities. He thinks his skills can keep Sally safe, safe from the murderous Lithgow character, who we see has murdered again in an extended sequence of suspense and gore, hinted at, but still very brutal. De Palma was a massive devotee of Hitchcock. He admired not just his style and technique, but his content as well. His 1977 film, Obsession, reads like a college thesis project on Hitchcock, following the basic plot beats of Vertigo. The extended sequence in Dress to Kill where we follow Angie Dickinson at the museum is an obvious homage to Hitchcock, though deftly staged, Things like this often got De Palma maligned as simply a Hitchcock imitator, something that annoyed him very much, which he saw as a cheap critique, and so do I, as he always insisted that he looked at Hitchcock's filmmaking as a sort of cinematic lexicon, as a style with which to make movies. In her review of Brian De Palma's 1984 film Body Double, his usually dependable advocate Pauline Kael noted that the big showy scenes recall Vertigo and Rear Window so obviously that the movie is like an assault on the people who have put De Palma down for being derivative, This time he's just spiting himself and giving them reasons not to like him. If this assessment is true, then it reinforces the idea of De Palma's combative nature, his inclination to be subversive, which I think might turn people off more than just his proclivity to crib from Hitchcock. There's a tendency to cast De Palma as a sort of Hitchcock unchained by reading his movies as, you know, the films Hitchcock hypothetically would have made had he not been hampered by the censorship and mores of his time. And if this is the case, then it's easy to see why this endeavor might be cast as misguided, i.e. the reason Hitchcock's movies were so good is because he had to be clever in the way he smuggled in otherwise perverse content. You know, much hay has been made about how little you really see in the shower scene from Psycho, but the direction, editing, and the music is so effective, you believe you've witnessed something more brutal and violent than you really have. Whereas De Palma, from the perspective of his critics, dresses up his films with all of the Hitchcockian trappings and references, but with none of the subtlety, none of the artistry. The violence is just too blatant for some people this time around. In his book, Un-American Psycho, author Chris Dumas makes the brilliant observation that to De Palma's critics, De Palma represents an extreme derivation from Hitchcock the Master. Much like Jimmy Stewart's students in Hitchcock's film Rope, Whereas Jimmy Stewart's character was willing to pontificate on the abstract idea of killing for pleasure and thrill, he never intended anyone to actually do it. You were right to, if nothing else, a man should stand by his words. But you've given my words a meaning that I never dreamed of. And you've tried to twist them into a cold, logical excuse for your ugly murder. We can easily read De Palma as the gobsmacked student from Rope, deeply hurt that his professor is aghast at what he's done, considering that he was the one who inspired him to do it in the first place. It's interesting to note, then, that Hitchcock, according to John Landis, didn't much like De Palma's obsession, and especially disliked Dress to Kill. Hitch did not like the movie. He was offended by the obvious references to Hitchcock, and clearly it's a love letter to Hitchcock, and and De Palma's, you know making this Hitchcockian movie. But Hitch was terribly upset by the fact that all the reviews said Hitchcockian. Mr. Hitchcock was saying, you know, he was stealing from him and stuff. And I said, I'm sorry, you know, Hitch, he's not stealing from you. It's an homage. Right. And without hesitation, he said, 
You mean fromage? I would have loved to have heard Hitchcock's opinion on Blowout, though, as I believe that with this movie, De Palma achieves his stated goal of using Hitchcockian means to fulfill De Palmaian ends. The film's climax begins at a train station for the inevitable setup. The phone call, obviously, was not from the newsman. It was from the prowling Lithgow, and he snatches Sally away, keeping up the ruse as he violently drags her from Jack's protection. In his book, A Long Time Ago in a Cutting Room Far Away, De Palma's longtime collaborator, editor Paul Hirsch, spends a surprisingly brief amount of time on his work on Blowout, which struck me as odd because I thought, you know, that as an editor cutting a film about a sound editor, that he'd have a lot to talk about. But as readers, we can tell that at this time, Hirsch and De Palma's relationship was becoming frayed. They wouldn't work together for another 15 years. For the scenes in which Sally is bugged and kidnapped by Lithgow, Hirsch suggested that rather than a train station, the sequence take place on a boardwalk or somewhere else with a set of identifiable unique sounds that can give Travolta hints as to their location. Instead, Travolta runs around and listens to dialogue cues from the actors. I think Hirsch was probably right it maybe would have been a little more interesting to pay off the setup of being secretly wired with a sound device, but the scene is still effective. The film's budget was doubled after the addition of Big Star Travolta to the cast, which gave their production money to stage big scenes like this, where Travolta races his Jeep through a crowded street of parade-goers in pursuit of Sally. This sequence is fun and delivers a lot of action, but it's the climactic battle for Sally's life that makes the movie truly memorable and left me so affected. It's a beautiful sequence where Travolta arrives just a little too late. Sally has already been killed. And sure, he's able to get revenge and subdue Lithgow, but so what? The evil deed has been done. Travolta has failed. And all of this is contrasted against an impossibly beautiful 360-degree panorama of celebratory fireworks. The immediate resolution of the movie comes when we return to the screening room of the film's opening, and the audience is punched in the gut. Jack finally found his scream. Travolta's delivery is excellent, pained, deadened. It's with this move, turning Sally's scream into a sound cue in a cheap horror movie, that Travolta has given up. By appropriating the sound of her death for something so based and lowbrow and commercial, he's become part of the same system that killed her. I think it's fair to say that Brian De Palma isn't remembered as fondly as his contemporary New Hollywood directors, though he does get lumped into that narrative in books like Peter Biskin's Easy Riders, Raging Bulls, or Mark Harris's Pictures at a Revolution. There's not much of a payoff to his inclusion in these stories, though. No one ever argues that he changed Hollywood forever like Lucas or Spielberg, or that he maintained prominence as a legendary working director like Martin Scorsese. He was definitely around at that time. He gave Robert De Niro his first acting role. He made competent and fun thrillers like Sisters and Obsession, even memorable offbeat cult classics like The Phantom of the Paradise during the 1970s, but in the eyes of the film intelligentsia, he never produced a seminal work associated with the period. No Godfather or Easy Rider, no Deer Hunter, no Nashville. His biggest role in that story is always as a filmmaker who embodied the values of the new Hollywood movement, or who was adjacent to it someone involved in anecdotes mainly about other filmmakers and other films. For instance, you know, Schrader initially wrote Taxi Driver for him to direct. He was famously an early critic of Star Wars, purportedly lambasting the movie at Lucas's famous home screening. When Spielberg predicted that it would be the biggest hit of all time, De Palma voiced his critique that the force was a stupid idea. His biggest hit of the 1970s was the Stephen King adaption, Carrie, 
a movie he cast in a joint session with Lucas, who was also looking for young talent for Star Wars. Carrie is an achievement that gets De Palma lumped into another story, the narrative of the new Hollywood horror film movement alongside the likes of John Carpenter, Toby Hooper, and George Romero. Directing Carrie grants De Palma a fleeting reference in Jason Zinneman's book, Shock Value, but he didn't sustain that classification. He didn't continue making high-concept action-oriented horror films like those directors. Instead, he made frightening, lurid, Hitchcock homages. Films like Body Double and Dress to Kill, movies championed by filmmakers like Quentin Tarantino and authors like Bret Easton Ellis. He had one consistent contemporary advocate, Pauline Kael. But at the time, De Palma was marginalized as a filmmaker obsessed with tawdry subjects. And though the legacy of his films have been somewhat rehabilitated in the past 10 years as many viewers rediscover his work, but modern scholars and critics still deride him as misogynistic, homophobic, transphobic, sexist, you know, overall problematic. He's an openly political filmmaker in line with Oliver Stone, but he never made enough openly political movies to be thought of as a social advocate or as a quasi-pundit like Stone. And the films he made that were big commercial hits, movies like Scarface, Mission Impossible, The Untouchables, seem to lack the same type of authorial stamp that would make them intrinsically De Palma movies. While well-remembered by the general public, these movies, when viewed by De Palma diehards, seem to lack the personality that made his early work so compelling. De Palma is difficult to put into a box. He's curmudgeonly, and like William Friedkin, he can be dismissive, pugnacious, and he seems not to care what other people think about him. And that willingness to be real and raw is, I think, what makes him so compelling to a certain segment of film fans, namely me. He's also a meticulous technical director, which to me is what makes him especially interesting. I look at De Palma's movies, and I get inspired. He continually finds ways to present information to the viewer in deceptively simple ways, Ways that can be emulated or, you know, ripped off by low-budget filmmakers like me. Watch this scene in Blowout when Travolta finds out that all of his tapes have been erased by the conspirators. The camera stays stationary on the tripod. It just moves in a constant circle, conveying disorientation. Perfectly melded with the rising cacophony of the playing of blank tapes. White noise that somehow seems to mount, crowd out your thoughts. It disorients the viewer. We understand Travolta's frazzled state of mind as he glides in and out of the frame. Deceptively difficult choreography, and Travolta, a trained dancer, makes it look easy. This scene works on multiple levels. It jolts the movie up with tension and paranoia, because we want Terry to preserve the evidence so that he can foil the plot. The fact that his tapes have all been erased puts him in a major bind. It also shows that the villains are closing in on him. They know what he knows, and the implication is that they will go farther than just tapes in their quest to erase evidence. It's also something any filmmaker can relate to, the knot in the pit of your stomach when something you've worked hard to produce doesn't come out right, or it gets erased, or it doesn't save correctly, and all your work goes down the drain. What you've captured with your audio equipment or with your camera is a little piece of life that you've managed to orchestrate control over, and when forces beyond your control sabotage your material, there's a feeling of helpless defeat. This scene parallels the real-life making of the film, when four reels of the negative featuring the movie's most expensive sequence, the car chase through the parade, were stolen off the truck transporting them to the processing lab. The entire sequence needed to be reshot at the expense of half a million dollars. This is especially interesting considering how often the idea of the blending of artificial television or film media and real life appears in De Palma's work. At the opening of Blowout, the viewer is treated to an extended fake-out sequence, as we watch an over-the-top parody of a traditional slasher movie where a voyeuristic killer stalks a bevy of attractive young women in various stages of sexual undress or activity, only to discover at the climax, for lack of a better word, of the sequence, that we're actually watching a movie within a movie. <laughs> God, the scream is terrible. <laughs> what cat did you strangle to get that? The cat that you hired, that's her voice. We suddenly realize that what we have just seen is a joke, or was, you know, fake, and now we are comfortably sitting within a movie that is actually going to be good, by dint of the acknowledgement of our characters that what we have just seen is judged by them to be bad. This bit of fun serves to accomplish two of De Palma's goals. For one, it fulfills his stated wish to start his movies in a captivating way. You know, when you start a movie with a helicopter shot of New York, it, you know, it's like, is this an idea? Oh, we're in Manhattan? <laughs> Or, you know, these boring drive-ups where the whole opening of the movie is a car driving up to a building. 
I mean, this is not an idea, you know, because especially in the beginning of a movie where the audience is ready for anything, you know, to waste that time with some boring uh, geography shot is like, uh, it mystifies me. And two, I think it's fair to read this sequence as a jab at his critics, critics who lambasted his previous effort, Dressed to Kill, as nothing more than a prurient slasher film. It's as if De Palma is saying to them, hey, I know what schlock is. This is what it looks like. My last film was not this. This purposeful confusion between the real and the artificial is present in a lot of De Palma's movies. We see it in his 1972 film Sisters, as the movie opens with an uncomfortable scene of a man struggling with the dilemma of whether or not to make his presence known to an attractive blind woman who is beginning to undress, before discovering that what we were watching is actually a hidden camera reality TV game show. His 1996 movie Snake Eyes is full of these ideas, whether it be a mediation of material through a television screen, or watching the literal construction and manipulation of what will eventually become truth by media forces. Fans who have braved Hurricane Jezebel to cut, cut, can't see it. They want you to call it a tropical storm, not a hurricane. But it is a hurricane. Yeah, well, it's also a holiday weekend, so will you please just call it a tropical storm, please? I love this town. They even spin the weather. All right, listen. In the previous two examples, we see De Palma's penchant for identifying the perverse ability of mass media to engineer the reality that we perceive. By virtue of De Palma's presentation of this idea in his films, he is encouraging the audience to remain open to the possibility that what they are being told by the mass media can, and very well might be, orchestrated to manipulate them. In Blowout, Jack Terry is often frustrated when watching the official media news narrative. Was he alone? Was he alone in the car? Well, I didn't see anybody. Why didn't you go to the police that night? Why didn't oh, you show no. the film no, 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 no. Because he has the secret truth, the piece of missing material evidence that is being withheld, purposefully, maybe, from the public. 1974's The Parallax View is a movie about the loss of control as well, but it's more about a democratic society's inability to achieve self-determination when sinister forces overturn the will of the people. In Parallax View, the sinister conspirators kill politicians who won't play ball and systemically take out any opposition to their grand schemes. Oliver Stone talks about this very phenomenon at the end of his new documentary of Kennedy, JFK Revisited, describing the chilling effect that JFK's murder had on the American political system. The feeling that if a leader were to stray too far from the goals of a deep state or a corporate cabal, that that leader would be taken out. Publicly executed, framed, or intimidated. Whatever. Implicit in this notion, though, is the idea that there is some all-knowing, controlling body that is guiding society. And while this is a very bleak idea, it's at least somewhat reassuring that someone is in control that society is being managed by somebody? At the end of both The Parallax View and Winter Kills, the conspirators are able to suppress the truth by force, the implication being that if they hadn't been able to snuff out their opposition, there is a possibility that they could be exposed, that the public would discover their crimes, that they could, in theory, be held accountable if only their power could be defeated. In Blowout, this idea is rejected. And while Jack is correct, the senator's death was not an accident. It was perpetrated by a shadowy group. You know, I don't get you, man. First you feed me all this nutty assassination shit, then you give me a blank tape. What for? Be because somebody erased it. They've erased all my tapes. And then again, even the shadowy group doesn't have full control over their plan. Conspiracies hatched at the highest level can be mucked up by low-level maniacs like John Lithgow's hired killer, who takes it upon himself to perpetuate even more gruesome violence in opposition to his orders. You were supposed to get some pictures of McGrath, not kill him. I understood the objectives of the operation. I never concurred with them. But I didn't kill him. It was an accident. You accidentally shot out the tire of his car? As you may recall, this was my initial plan as proposed in our meeting of June the 6th. We rejected that plan, don't you remember? Of course, I do admit I had to exceed the parameters of my authority somewhat, but I always stayed within an acceptable margin of error. After all, the objective was achieved. He was eliminated from the election. In other words, De Palma's conspiracy world is one of chaos. Nothing can be successfully managed, not even by the managers. All we can do is watch things unfold, and everyone is powerless to stop it. No one is really in charge to be held accountable which I think is probably a more nihilistic notion about what government is as opposed to the simple totalitarian vision presented by Stone and Pakula. And to make matters even worse, in De Palma's own words, 
it's not so much that the conspirators in Blowout get away with it. It's that even if Jack were able to expose them, that nobody would care. There's this sort of notion of paranoia and, and conspiracy out in the world, and the ordinary person in some ways opening up a world that's been closed to him, and once it's open... Well, that goes back to being a, a Kennedy assassination buff. You know, it goes back to greetings and hi, Mom. I mean, the whole idea of all this information, and, you know, you get obsessed with it. And in this instance, as probably in the Kennedy assassination, nobody cares anymore, even if you found... I mean, it, when you have such an intensive investigation, you have so many variations of what happened, so you don't know, and it's like blow up, where all you see is grain when you get so big and big, you can't even discern anything anymore. And this is a kind of investigation that there's, you know, for every, you know, A, you have a B, and for every B, you have a C, so it, it becomes ultimately a, a confusing count, count, a point counterpoint. The detective at one point, you know, says, who the hell cares about this stuff anyway? I mean, you know, you know all this paranoia stuff, and then, you know, John's saying, well, this is why I want to, this is what actually happened, and the guy says, you know, who cares? Nobody cares anymore. A variation of this idea is present in Snake Eyes, where even if you do have the bravery and the courage to tell the truth, like Nicolas Cage's character of Rick Santoro, your reward will be to basically have your life ruined. In essence, De Palma's worldview indicts not only the evildoers, but the shallow and apathetic public. The people are complicit too. It would be better that one simply go along to get along, because you can't win. De Palma often brought a lot of personal history to his movies. Many of his characters are informed by his life. A well-known anecdote about the juvenile De Palma rescuing his mother from a failed marriage by secretly recording his father's various affairs is often used to psychoanalyze De Palma and his work. This is an example of De Palma employing his talents to exert a certain amount of control over his own life. And in his early accounts, this youthful ploy of parental sabotage led to a successful outcome. His tortured mother was able to get a divorce from his philandering father. It's only later that De Palma has publicly wrestled with his actions, hypothesizing that maybe there was more to the story that he just didn't see at the time. And what's relevant to your work, of course, is that it sounded as if you tried in some way to observe your father during his affair. Uh, I read you climbed trees and tried to photograph him. Is that true? Yes, it is. Consequently, all the information I got was from my uh, mother, because my father was sort of cut out of uh, having any kind of contact with us, really. And so only years later did you sort of get the other side of the story. As you know, there are always two sides to all these stories. That his attempt to expose the truth and bring justice, to exert control over his life, was a vain and counterproductive one. That maybe it had been better had he not done anything at all. Guys, thanks again for watching this video, and I really appreciate you subscribing. I just want to give a shout out to two really good books that I would recommend that you check out if you're a Brian De Palma fan. This one is called Double De Palma. It's by Susan Dworkin, and it is a day-by-day -day set account of what it was like to be with De Palma on set while he made Body Double. You get a lot of really interesting insights into Brian De Palma, the man, through testimonials and interviews with people who were on the crew. And kind of get an insight into how he works. Uh, he's an interesting cat. This one is a little more academically oriented, and I, I can't say that all the time my eyes don't glaze over. I have to go back and reread. But this is a book cut by Chris Dumas, and it's called Un-American Psycho, and it's a uh, subtitle, Brian De Palma and the Politically Invisible. Um, it's a really interesting analysis of the politics of Brian De Palma's films, and it also spends some time interrogating the assumptions of contemporary academia when it comes to film study, which actually I found kind of interesting. And he uses Brian De Palma as a lens by which to do this because he sort of singles out critics of him as sort of being an autopilot. Uh, the idea of not liking Brian De Palma has become sort of like fashionable and in vogue uh, amongst certain sectors of academia because he's made movies that like, I guess the intelligentsia sees as like less than deserving of conversation because they are, you know, sexist or misogynistic or whatever. He interrogates this idea to figure out if that's in fact true. Uh, and he's really fair to the Palma. And I think it's a study and a critique that the director deserves because his work is for me really inspiring as I touched on in this video. So thanks so much for watching guys. 
and I'll check you out later. Check you later. Jesus Christ. See, I'm not going to read. I, I know that that is totally lame to say, but I'm not going to redo this entire thing just so I don't, don't have to say check you later at the end. Please subscribe. Thank you.